Hello, everyone. My name is Robin Steffen, and I work at Amidiar Network, which is a philanthropic investment firm here in the Bay Area. And we are here today to talk about corporate impact investors. And this is not a new phenomenon. In fact, as we're going to learn in just a minute, the Catalyst Fund has been doing this for six years. There are many others. But this really rose to the top for SOCAP 2017 because there have been a couple notable developments in just the last year. And they're here with us today. So Twilio.org launched its Impact Investing Fund this summer. And actually, Salesforce just launched an Impact, in impact Investing Fund last week. And we're going to dig in. I know you guys have lots of questions about what they're doing. Um, so we're going to jump into all of that. But first, I just wanted to take a step back and say, why does this matter for the impact investing market? Why is it important? And so to do that, I actually want to roll back the clock and rewind back to 1998. And I know that's nearly 20 years ago, and so we have a lot of millennials at SOCAP. Feels like ancient history, right? But 1998 was the, the year that eBay IPO'd. And so the founders of Amidiar Network, Pam and Pierre Amidiar, actually found themselves with unimaginable wealth. And because of their experience in founding and scaling eBay, it was intuitive to them that when they thought about how they would use that wealth for social change, that they would harness the markets, that they would think about not just grants, but also impact investments. And when they thought about impact investments, they intuitively thought about doing early stage risk capital for innovative companies that have tremendous potential for scale. And in fact, in the impact investing market, there's a real dearth of that early stage risk capital. And so when we see new players, like those that are sharing the stage today, we get really excited because we know that there's a lot of that shared DNA and that there's both the intuition as well as a really special set of insights and skill sets to help early stage companies that can have tremendous impact be able to grow and to have that impact. And in fact, we're already seeing that. So we have a number of co-investments with my with fellow panelists who we'll introduce in just a moment, um, uh, including Hustle, um, also Indela, which maybe we'll get a chance to talk about. And so that's kind of one of the first pieces around why is this important, which is we need lots of early stage risk capital. And actually, uh, Silicon Valley startups are uniquely positioned to be able to step into some of those, some of those gaps. Um, but there's another piece as well, which is, to put them a little bit on the spot in a way that they would probably never say on their own, but we've noticed that both Salesforce and Twilio really have a lot of influence on their peers. Um, and we saw that in part in the way that both really embedded impact into their DNA from the very beginning in, with the 111 corporate philanthropy model. And that actually today is not something that just uh, Salesforce and Twilio are doing, but in fact, hundreds of companies have taken that pledge 1%. And so as we sit here today with the Catalyst Fund having paved the way um, for, for corporate venture to think about impact, um, with Salesforce and Twilio leaning in, it raises a question of, this is October 2017, what will the world look like in 2020? Could we imagine this becoming business as usual? So we're going to get to that at the very end, including some thoughts around if you're in a, a similar spot, how do you get started? But before we do that, I want to introduce you to the fabulous folks who are going to be digging in with the conversation with us today. So immediately to my right, I have Kai Bond, who's at, who is head of investing at, Catal at Catalyst Fund. And Kai is a serial entrepreneur. He has founded three startups in the last three years. The most recent Pixie TV was sold to Samsung. As, um, so as I mentioned, Catalyst Fund has actually been around for six years um, and has made 77 investments, which is just incredible. So we're really looking forward to learning from some of that track record um, that you've seen and, and, and what's come from them. Um, we also have uh, next is Suzanne Di DiBianca, uh, who is Executive Vice President of Corporate Relations and Chief Philanthropy Officer at Salesforce. Uh, Suzanne, for those of you who know her, is just a leading light um, in corporate philanthropy. Uh, we already talked about how Salesforce pioneered this 111 model um, that was really groundbreaking. Uh, really, that was Suzanne when she had her previous role um, as both founder and president of the Salesforce Foundation, also salesforce.org. So we're really excited to have you with us as well. And last but certainly not least, Aaron Riley has been for 20 years now thinking about leading social and environmental change at companies that you probably have heard of. So Google, Yahoo, Nike, and now at Twilio. And so um, as uh, vice president of social impact and general manager of twilio.org, 
Uh, in addition to leading their work on impact investing, she is also unlocking the potential of software developers to code for a better world, which I love. So, I know that we want to get to the hard questions, but first let's just set the stage a little bit. Um, and actually just start with the question of motivation. So Kai, I want to turn to you. For Comcast, why create the Catalyst Fund? Oh. What, was, what was the purpose? What were the, the key reasons sure. that that happened six years ago? So there are a couple of key reasons. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting space for us. You know, as we look at Comcast, NBC, Universal, um, it's very interesting when you look at the, the executives inside of the organization and what they value and what we see as good business. And, you know, uh, I've spent a lot of opportunity, I have the opportunity to spend a lot of time um, with executives across the organization. And, and when you talk to, you know, what makes for good ratings on TV, right? It's diversity and inclusion. What are the shows that over index in terms of ratings, um, you know, this is sort of core to the DNA, right? Like you think about the organization buying Telemundo, right? We see a shifting demographic in the country. And so it's important that as we look at not only established media, but new and upcoming startups, that diversity and inclusion is a key part of the mix. And so we see this not only as an opportunity for social impact, but real business opportunity. And, and we've seen that impact the bottom line of our business for many, many years. And so it was key uh, for that reason. And I think a big part, you know, when we just look at the numbers, it's, you know, 1% of venture funding goes to African-American and Latino founders, right? Eight, maybe 9% go to female founders. Um, and when you look at, you know, the opportunity uh, to innovate and to sort of go against the grain of what has become normal and accepted behavior, uh, we see it as a tremendous opportunity um, to support uh, sort of what have become underrepresented groups inside of the venture ecosystem. Fantastic. And Aaron, you guys just launched this summer. Tell us, give us a behind the scenes look about what really drove that decision. Sure. Uh, and in case you're not, whoa, um, <laughs> in case you're not familiar with Twilio, basically we are a cloud communications company that really powers the text, video, and voice for many of the services you use every day. You get an Uber and it says your Uber's on its way or call the driver, that's us, or American Red Cross uses us to deploy uh, volunteers into the disaster zones. Um, so we really believe that many of the wor world's problems are both caused and solved by communications. And so we want to be on the solving end of that and empowering companies and organizations that are solving social and environmental problems through communications. And so a couple years ago, we joined Pledge 1% one, Pledge 1 to the leadership of Salesforce. And so in addition to the product donations and volunteer time of our employees, we uh, committed 1% of our equity social impact, and that was about over $20 million. And of course, we were thinking about grants. This is going in and out. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so we were, of course, thinking about doing grants, but we also see a, large, a very growing part of our economy that is driving social impact, but through a for-profit model. And we wanted to support those companies as well. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I think we have a core belief at Twilio that social impact and business value are a virtuous cycle, and so we want to support the companies that are doing that. And in essence, you can think about Twilio.org as a social enterprise also, so clearly we support that model and wanted to Fantastic. And Suzanne, I want to make sure to, to get your, um, your sense as well. You guys just launched last week, which is really exciting. Congratulations. But I know you've been doing um, deals behind the scenes for quite some time now. So tell us a little bit about the early days and, and how this came to be um, within Salesforce. Sure. Um, so Salesforce uh, is an enterprise CRM company based here in San Francisco. We have about 25,000 employees around the world. We're about a $10 billion company. I've been there since the very beginning when we were about 50 people. Um, and I ran the, like you said, the .org for a long time. And I kind of personally needed a change. And um, I, at the same time as I was looking at like, what do I want to do next? And I'm sort of a capitalist by nature. And I loved working in the nonprofit sector for as long as I did. But I started uh, to really think about and with the rise of Tesla and, and pulling out of Paris and, you know, I think everything that we've learned around energy, sometimes you can go faster with social problems than the for-profit model. Uh, both are completely valid. 
But at the same time, uh, as I was kind of looking for a change, it turns out we've become the third largest corporate VC uh, in the world next to um, Google and Intel. And so I sort of had a hypothesis and I, and I brought a great um, woman from Stanford MBA, Lucy, who's here and did a fantastic job um, for us to uh, sort of put together an analysis on like, is, is there a there there? If we brought some intentionality to the portfolio, mm -hmm. could we find great companies in all of our strategic criteria that we still hold and remain true to, uh, if we brought some intentionality to it, could we find companies that sort of fit energy, education, workforce development, uh, diversity and inclusion is a category for us and apps for social good. So, Turns out, um, according to Lucy and others, there was a massive there there. Uh, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit, actually. So we've done a bunch of deals. We sort of talked about four when we launched, but we've done a lot more than that in those four categories. And um, so it was an experiment, and it's been great. We have great support from the Ventures team in finding these companies. And really, it's kind of an extension of our philanthropic commitment, just in a different market. And so you talked about the sectors that you're focused on. Tell us a little bit more about what your sweet spot is in terms of ticket size. What are other criteria that are must have for you when you're thinking yeah. about what a good deal is? And yeah. maybe, maybe give us an example. I know you, you, you talked about four of the investments that um, you were, you, you have been public with so far. Maybe give us a little bit of a flavor of one that, that you're sure. really excited about. Sure, the, so the Salesforce Ventures Fund overall um, has done about close to 300 investments. We've got about 200 active investments in our portfolio overall today. Um, we are an enterprise software company, so we are looking uh, for companies that are integrated to Salesforce, built on Salesforce, aligned to our values. Um, uh, so we're a strategic investor. And you have to have a, you have gotta have a tie into our product technology, and sometimes we invest in front of. Um, but that's sort of the key, that's the, that's the minimum bar. Uh, we focus on series A, B, so we're not really early stage, but it's why we love partnering with Omidyar and K4 and others who come in a little bit earlier. Um, our check sizes have been between about 300,000 uh, and 2 million, 3 million, say, uh, and we never lead rounds. Um, so those are sort of the key sort of criteria coming in. And then, like I said before, um, Education and workforce development is a category. Sustainability is a category. Diversity and inclusion, and um, uh, broadly apps for social good. So just to run you through one of them, and actually a lot of our portfolio companies are here, um, both at this event, um, but they're kind of all over the world. One is Elvest. I haven't seen Sally here, but she's, um, I think she's speaking here. She's incredible, former executive at Merrill Lynch. We've done a lot of work at our company around the um, uh, equal pay for women. And what Sally is working on is she's working on the investment gap. Uh, many times women just uh, kind of lose out on investment potential because we're more apt to just shove money under the, under the bed uh, versus sort of aggressively invest it. So she's been really working on, on that. And it's obviously very aligned to our company values around equality for women, but she's building on Heroku, which is a development platform, and she's leveraging one of our products called Communities to sort of get her uh, communities of women together, her financial advisors together with women. So that's just one example and sort of how the criteria rolls. Fantastic. And Kai, I know that uh, the Catalyst Fund comes in super early stage. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that and what the sweet spot looks for you. Looks sure. Like for you. Yeah, so we invest everywhere from, you know, 50,000 up to 2 million. Uh, we're really sector agnostic. Uh, you know, for us, the, uh, the main focus is can this company scale? Can it grow? Can it have meaningful impact? And so, you know, one of the examples of a company in our portfolio uh, is Jopwell, right? And we know that there's oftentimes, uh, you know, this claim of a, of a, of a pipeline issue for talent uh, for African-American and Latinos uh, inside of organizations. Um, great business, you know, selling a SaaS platform, 
uh, great revenue growth, great scale, uh, but at the same time having a real impact on the lives of African American and Latinos um, to find you know, amazing work post-college. And so that's one of the investments that we sort of hold as a, an example of the, the type of founders we're looking for. And, and that's just, you know, again, a very good business that's growing and scaling and doing well, but has real impact in the world. Terrific. Aaron, what about Vertilio.org? Yeah, we uh, focus on seed in Series A, and our check sizes are somewhere between fifty and two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we never lead. Also, uh, and our focus is uh, really funding those companies that are solving social and environmental problems through communications, and the way that we sort of our easy way of determining if a company is using communications in a really innovative way is are they using Twilio? Since we think using Twilio is using communications in an in innovative way. So that's a, a bar. Um, and then one of the elements that is unique to how we have done this, and it, was, it would have been impossible to do this without uh, partnering with some really phenomenal impact investing um, com uh, organizations, Omidyar, Kapoor Capital, Draper Richards Kaplan, Village Capital, and Gates Foundation. And that really complemented, we, ha we had some expertise in determining if a company is using communications in an innov innovative way, but we needed to leverage all of the expertise in social impact investing from the, the organizations that had been doing it for so long. And then we can also share pipeline and also provide a lot more strategic value to the portfolio companies of our partners. Um, so that was an element that really helped us do what we're doing. Um, and then as far as sort of a company that we've invested in that we're particularly excited about, um, Edovo is one of those. And it's a company that is helping inmates stay connected with their friends and family outside of prison through voice calls and texting, as well as getting educated on tablets for things like GEDs or a trucker's license so that those inmates can be more well prepared for life outside of prison. And both education and connection to family members and friends um, really reduces re recidivism, and so um, the impact there was super clear to us, and the use of uh, communications in an innovative way. Terrific, and I want to transition us to actually talking specifically about what it means to be a strategic investor in terms of what that brings to the table for your investees um, in, in, in the impact investing space. And Aaron, let's start with you because you talked about kind of where some of your sourcing comes from and it's been fantastic actually for us as well to share a pipeline um, and take a look at different deals. And one of the things that we've talked about is actually to your point about having a unique sense of who's using communications to do innovative things, but also you actually can see in part based on um, the use of uh, the Twilio platform, who's getting traction with customers? So that seems like something that um, for many impact investors in the room is not the case. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a strategic investor in terms of sourcing um, and, and what you see. Yeah, I think um, the benefit, I often think that the cash that we provide is less valuable than, than a lot of our technical and strategic expertise that we can provide. Um, as far as that value to the companies that we invest in, um, as I mentioned, most of them are already using communications in a strategic way, but then they get what we call the Twilio bear hug. Um, so we provide additional technical expertise. They get early access to uh, new products and features. They get favorable pricing. They get access to our Twilio.org impact core, which is basically um, a tremendous community of volunteers volunteer developers who want to help social enterprises. And so it can start off as just an hour-long advisory session around a technical problem, but could bloom into a full-scale volunteer coding project. All social enterprises, by the way, are, um, are open to use Twilio.org Impact Core. Um, but then, the, uh, obviously, the, the companies we invest in get an extra special sort of love in that regard. And then as you were mentioning, the value that we provide to our impact investing um, partners also comes in as a value to those companies because 
uh, companies that come to us and are using Twilio and that are interested in funding from us give us permission to share that information with our in investing partners. And since we have sort of a proprietary glimpse into uh, the promising indicators of a company um, through seeing their volume growth on our platform, we can share that with impact investing partners and really flag some promising companies but also open more doors for more funding for these companies that are looking for, for capital. Thank you. And I know, Suzanne, the beyond capital piece is something um, that you have talked about as well. And so maybe you can share with us an example of one of your investees where you felt like there was a real win-win and yeah. what you saw in terms of that integration, what it looks like at its very best. Yeah, it's early days for us. Um, we want to bring a lot more human capital to play. Um, we've been so focused on finding deals and getting them done in the last year. So just quite honestly, um, it's it's pretty early. But we we know just like Twilio, I mean, obviously from a, from a products and services uh, perspective, we're able to really um, help these companies early on, whether they're in the beta for, for new products, we can give them access to product managers. Frankly, we have 150,000 customers um, that they can leverage. We have a, a ton of app exchange partners, which is sort of our like app store. Um, so if you put your product up on the app store, you know, you're in front of our whole customer base. So really it's kind of access to customers, access to the ecosystem. We've got, like I mentioned, 270 uh, portfolio companies who have raised money from a whole bunch of other sources and we bring together the whole portfolio pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. So I think our companies just like the other 260 or, or so that are, um, they weren't really in the impact fund. They're kind of sharing investor networks. Um, but we want to do a lot more on the, on the pro bono developer side and like that. But I think that's the benefit you get being with a corporate. You may have more kind of hurdles to jump into, but then you get access to the customer base. Yeah. Fantastic. And Kai, you've already shared with us that you have this super bullseye focus on minority entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And that is actually a really hot topic right now in Silicon Valley. And so you've touched on it briefly, but I just want to address it whole on, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, when you think about the impact you want to have on the world, why do you put a, a strong spotlight specifically on minority entrepreneurs? Sure. So, you know, from our perspective, when you look at the, uh, you know, the demographics of the population and, and where we live and the time that we live in, um, it's critical to actually have all minds at the table. I think when you get a, any sort of myopic uh, train of thought, um, it's very limiting. And so, you know, for us, the long-term vision is, you know, how do we take uh, every single voice that's out there and actually cultivate, you know, innovation from voices that have been unheard for a long time. And so it's critical for us to, to sort of grow, I think, as a society as a whole, to have diversity. But, you know, we work very closely with Female Founders Fund, BBG. You know, we look at uh, diversity and inclusion across the board, um, while our focus is, is uh, you know, particularly on the diversity aspect. I think, you know, we've done deals with every single person on the stage. Um, and, and at the end of the day, everyone looks at the founders and says the same thing. This is a great founder. This is a great business that will have real impact. Um, and that's where we try to focus. Fantastic. And you've been doing this the longest. You have only been at Catalyst Fund for one year. But right. as a fund, you have, you know, 70 plus investments under your belt. That's right. What are some of the, what are the some of the unexpected challenges? I think it's the, you know, the same story. If I went to the Valley and talked to early stage investors, you know, you're talking about 50K checks into what are sometimes first time founders. Uh, those issues don't go away, <laughs> right? So we, we actually share a very similar uh, sort of ethos. It's great to have, you know, Comcast Ventures and Comcast uh, overall, you know, 60% of our portfolio has some sort of strategic integration with Comcast, NBC Universal, um, and we're very proud of that. And you know, I think really the the um, you know what, you know to piggyback on what we've seen earlier and, and, and mentioned is even if there isn't a strategic integration that happens, right? You talk about a $50,000 check and maybe a $250,000 round. An early stage business isn't always able to scale at the pace of an organization that has over 100,000 employees, right? Uh, and so it's sort of critical for us to figure out what that pacing looks like, when we can bring folks into the right executives in the room and actually have an integration because if that fails, that's only going to hurt our, our effort uh, longer term down the road. And as you look back, um, 
who do you tend to see at the table in terms of co-investors? Co-investors, it, it depends on stage. Uh, we've done a lot of deals with uh, the k uh, as I think represents about 15% of our deal flow overlaps. Um, you know, we are, you know, starting to see more and more sort of micro funds focused on diversity and inclusion. Uh, but we've done a lot of work with Y Combinator. Uh, we've done a lot of work with 500 startups. So we look at that sort of post accelerator phase uh, as, as one that's really ripe for us uh, to go ahead and invest with. So we're proud of the, the accelerator partnerships that we've had. And as we scale, you know, continuing to work with um, other corporates as well as venture funds to take it to the next level. Yeah, and the, and the reason I ask is in part because you started with these, you know, really startling statistics mm -hmm. about how rarely you see minority entrepreneurs get VC funding. That's right. And so thinking about the fact that you are going in with the early stage capital that they, you know, that it's hardest to get That's and right. specifically focusing on a part of the market get, that gets overlooked, then I could imagine that sometimes you got to, you know, kind of bring people along with there are, you. There are a lot of angels out there who show us love, so <laughs> we're happy for them as well. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. And Suzanne, I know that you guys are just getting started, but you've been working internally um, for some time now, from that experience of um, starting the conversation with your corporate venture shop, what advice would you have for others that are just getting started? What did you learn from that experience? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we learned a lot, actually. Um, first is, you know, we're in a big corporation, so we have to, we don't want to ask for a pass, actually. We, we want to be really aligned to the strategy. At first, we sort of thought we would ask for a pass, especially in education, because mm. when I was at .org, we put $30 million into San Francisco public schools to, to wire them up and give them tablets, and they have nothing to run on the tablets. You know, it's early days uh, in ed tech in some areas. But, you know, I didn't, we didn't ask for a pass, and we found great companies anyway. So, you know, that was one thing. The, the other thing is, you know, we thought healthcare. Um, we have IOT, we big IoT practice, big AI practice, big partnership with IBM and Watson and uh, as a company. And we really were looking at the healthcare market and then we realized we actually don't really know anything about healthcare. <laughs> um, it's not really our core competence. We, we, um, we have a great healthcare vertical in the company who actually sees these uh, smaller companies and ISVs better. It's probably better for that vertical to be driving it. So we took healthcare off the list and we added workforce development to the list because um, we're doing a lot, as a company who's made a billion dollars in AI acquisitions over the last 18 months, um, we are, we're very focused, uh, in addition to sort of bringing AI into our CRM platform, really being mindful about the whole conversation around jobs that AI is gonna disrupt and is disrupting uh, right now. So, we have something called Trailhead, which is an online learning platform for, for free. And, and one of our companies in our portfolio is called Veritas. And they're integrated with Trailhead, and they're doing sort of a skills passport for students. It was founded by a veteran. A lot of vets come out of the military highly skilled, but don't know how to translate that into job recs. Um, and so we, were, we just found huge alignment with the workforce development um, kind of value in our company and, and like doing less about what are we saying about it and more what can we do about it. So we kind of flipped out for what we know about. That's really helpful. And, and you mentioned at the beginning some of the things that you thought might happen but didn't with regards to um, the strategic alignment within corporate ventures. Yeah. Did, you, did you think about it and, did, and, and what was the conversation like in terms of thinking about strategic alignment with the foundation? Was that just a completely set aside from the beginning or is it something you considered and decided against? Yeah, it's a good question. When I was at .org, um, we did our first two investments uh, through ventures in a couple of our partner companies. A great company called Classy uh, that I love. It's just one example who does um, uh, sort of crowdsource fundraising for large NGOs. So that was kind of our first foray into it. It's kind of why we have a, um, a gray category called Apps for Social Good because that category helps the .org team and the public sector team both. Um, as it relates to education and workforce development, that's where the .org is very focused and they have big practices there. So um, a lot of times we, lo we look with the higher ed team for, uh, for deals that are companies that are kind of plug into their different apps or we have something called the Nonprofit Starter Pack uh, that we built when, on the .org uh, team for NGOs to use and we're, we're always looking for add-ons and extensions to sort of existing products. So, um, it's very aligned to the strategy at .org. 
Thanks for setting. And Aaron, given that you've built your impact investing fund in a different part of the company, what advice would you have for your peers who are thinking about starting with impact investing fund and might initially be starting with what they have traditionally thought about as the philanthropic dollars within the, the company? Yeah, I think uh, the big surprise lesson learned I had was I thought um, working with our executive leadership, they would be more favorable to investing since they're so sort of bred and they know that world so, so well. But the issue was that they know that world so well that they know that at the seed and series A level of funding, there is a pretty high failure rate for companies. And so they thought, what happens if we invest in a company and 18 months down the line it goes away? Um, because in the commercial sector, that experience was that f that company goes away and you've lost whatever you put into it versus if you put it, that same money into a grant, you would have something to show for it. Um, that was the, the sort of pressure, the question. And the answer that really struck a chord, which thank you, Omidyar, this, is, we, this came in a conversation with Omidyar, is that um, for social enterprises, even if that company closes its doors in 18 months, you may still have helped 5,000 Kenyan rural farmers increase crop yields through voice-based lessons that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't invested. So that, that social impact still remains even if that, um, if that company closes its doors. So I think that was uh, one lesson. The other sort of quick lesson is if you end up doing this, um, this type of investing through a donor advised fund, which is what we do, uh, make sure you leave enough do, uh, time for the donor advised fund to do due diligence because they are the actual legal investor. So we kind of pushed uh, timelines a little too tightly because <laughs> we just didn't know. Yeah, and I, actually, that was something that I didn't know that is awesome. That uh, So Tides can run donor-advised funds for impact investing. Um, maybe a few other um, do. They just happen to be sort of a local, but they're a global organization. And so when these guys took a percent of their equity, which if you're whatever stage you are as a company, I would encourage you to join Pledge 1%. It's you stole my line. I totally Sorry. agree. <laughs> yeah, 3,000 companies now, right? But when you take a percent of your equity and you move it over, you can use it for charitable or impact giving. And um, it's like a really cool new model that we didn't know at .org at the time. And I would say I was just on a call with, you know, a dozen other social impact leaders in tech companies, sort of our peers last week. And I mentioned we rolled out this impact fund that's doing investing. And every single one of them said, what, really? You can do that? And yeah. so I think the message to Silicon Valley corporations is, yes, it's possible. Even if you thought it wasn't possible a year ago, things are progressing. And um, I recommend doing it through a donor advised fund um, because then uh, it's actually a lot smoother. It, um, you capitalize on a lot of their R already established infrastructure, we use tides, and yes, um, if you set aside 1% um, equity, profit, revenue to fund social impact, do grants, but make sure you also do uh, investing, because it's actually, in our experience, easier than we thought it would be. I think that's great advice, and one of the things that, because we see time and again that when people are just getting started with impact investing, figuring out how to do the deals, um, and whether that's going to be in-house or outsourced is one of the things that, that they really get stuck on. And so knowing that you can do it through a DAF, I think, is, is a great tip. And actually, Tides and also Impact Assets, which is also another vehicle for doing that, also local, are both here. And there's a couple panels around that at SOCAP. So um, that's a great uh, note on which we're actually going to start to turn to all of you. I am sure that there are questions, lots of them popping up. So just please, um, we're going to have a microphone come around to make sure that everyone can hear the question. Why don't we start right up here? Thank you, Austin. And please stand up and introduce sure. yourself with your question as well so we quick, have contact. So quick question. My name is Aubrey Ruby. I'm a co-founder of something called the Africa Expert Network. Big believer in strategic ventures uh, from the corporate side. How do you think we can get emerging market companies, the biggest of the world, say like a Dan Gote, to launch a Dan Gote Ventures? So because the emerging market companies, giants, behemoths, they can uh, interact in their markets and often have more impact within their local supply chains. But at least in the African context, I'm seeing very little movement on large African corporates creating ventures arms. So love the thought on how to share uh, the next steps for that as it diffuses that structure. 
how many of you are doing, are looking at emerging markets uh, as part of your investment? We're sort of accidentally looking at emerging markets. <laughs> <laughs> Climate change is in particular, it's a global issue, right? I mean, so, so is workforce development education. We happen to know more nationally about that. But the climate investments we've done have been, um, and Gaza was one of them, and they're, they're an amazing company. I think you guys were in that. We, deal. we weren't, but energy access is a uh, is, is Yeah, shared, we didn't bring intentionality sure. to it. We're not going to bring intentionality to it. We're not one of those big African companies. We're not a B2C company. Um, I think to Aaron's point, and, and maybe Kai, you have a different point of view about this, but... Um, I think there's just a lot of education that needs to be done with these companies that you can use charitable dollars to do for-profit investing. I don't know what the vehicles are in Africa for it. I didn't even know there was a vehicle for it in the US. So I just think there is a big miss in information, especially with the, like a lot of these foundation heads. Yeah, I mean, I would ask if they're doing grant funding, say, why not investing? Right. Partly because then you get, a, you get at least a chance that it goes back into the fund and you can do even more impact out of it. Yeah. And also on that note to the, the power of being able to use those philanthropic dollars that it gives a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do, not only from grants and not only investments, but a lot of flexibility in terms of what returns that you're targeting as well. Um, we had a bunch of other questions. Let's see where the mic is. Um, let's go over here uh, in the fifth row to the right. Hi there, uh, great talk so far. So I, I've got an internal and external uh, question. So, so I work in a corporate, we, we do a lot of grant making, particularly into Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, I know the question when I go with my, my plan around this is gonna be, well, why don't we just put more money into grants? And, and, and how do I build that case? And I've, I've heard a little bit about that. And, um, but the second thing is, is, is um, and attached to that is, how actually do I find or, you know, the, the right um, investments? Um, because I, I know that I've got predictability in terms of my, my grant making. I know how many will fail, grant give or take. I know, you know we're, we're funding hundreds of grants. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you could speak both to that internal angle in terms of building the case, but also um, you know, kind of how, how we actually put that money out into, into the field. Yeah, I think, you know, from my perspective, we, we have a lot of uh, R&D that goes on across the organization. And really, you know, one of the key tenants that we look at is this is an opportunity for R&D at a scale that we would never be able to accomplish, right? Some of the challenges that are coming in and, and the, uh, the founders that are pushing the boundaries. Uh, and so why not be a part of that, right? What, you know, we, we look at disruption across the industry and we see it happening every single day, you know, particularly in the space that we're in. And I don't think that anyone here is, is is, um, you know, uh, unique in that way. But, you know, we see it as, as an opportunity to get early view into what's going on in the future and be very close, right? You're taking a board seat, uh, or you're an advisor role, um, if there's a partnership integration. And so I think there's a certain aspect around investing that allows you to be closer into the organization, at least in the way in which we handle, you know, the strategic integrations. And so if you're taking a very strategic approach, um, you know, my, my case would be, be a part of the disruption, and then incorporate that and see how you actually uh, can benefit the company in the long term from it. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would just add um, to that quickly is just to take the Aunt Gaza. Um, uh, basically what they do is they create, um, they make it very affordable for, uh, for solar, and solar uh, products uh, that you can pay with sort of micro payments. And uh, why we knew we could help them was because their distributors were using Salesforce. And they were actually asking for integrations. Um, so we knew that we could bring our product and expertise in a, in a really unique way because it was kind of market driven. So that's the kind of thing that sort of corporate uh, VCs can sort of have an eye to versus independent. And then as far as the second half of your question, um, how do you develop your pipeline? My like best advice is go find other impact investors that you can partner with um, that are aligned with both your stage and your focus. We found our buddies to, to hold hands with, but, the, but you can do a survey and I'm happy to send you like the long list of all the different impact investors we, we took a look at, but basically find the one that's most analogous to what you're gonna be looking for and then it, it's so natural, the deal flow, because it's so, um, 
it's like a true partnership. We both benefit each other because we're getting capital to our priorities and we bring the strategic you know, partnership, like all of that type of, um, and, and so I would say find those, those, par those partners who know more than you do about that pipeline. Yeah, and there's a lot of people aren't building on Salesforce or aren't integrated or B2C, and we just flip them back over to you know, great folks who don't have that requirement. Yeah. And I think what you'll find, sorry, uh, is that you know, th for us in particular, there's no sort of getting elbowed out of deals, right? And, and you see that a lot of time in venture. And you know, if if uh, you know, a mid ER came to us and said, "Hey, you know, we think this is a great deal. We can we can bring you in for another fifty thousand, right? And, and you, we would love for you to help out and figure out to add value." There's a lot more camaraderie uh, around the space and a willingness to support one another, whether that's financially through access and tools, um, platform and services. Uh, so it, it, there's an interesting uh, dynamic that happens across the board with the, the type of investments you're working on. And just to, to, to bring a perspective as well, you know, when we think, when you ask the question of why not just do all grants? You know, from our perspective, if you're thinking about maximizing the change you want to have in the world, it just makes sense to use every single tool in your toolbox yep. to be able to have access to the right type of capital for the problem that you're trying to solve. And frequently, in, 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 and to be clear, impact investments are not a silver bullet. So we still absolutely need grants. Um, and, and it's critical to think about where it's most appropriate. But in the right instances, you because of the fact that scale requires more capital, it is um, sometimes uh, uh, easier to scale if you're investing in a company that maybe on day one can't attract commercial capital, but you help them to prove the business model to this place where they can then tap commercial markets to be able to get to that scale and don't have to just rely on, on philanthropy alone. So scale is a really big piece there, I think. We have questions over here. Let's go into the, the fifth row in the back. Hello, my name is Anaisa, I'm an impact investor, and I was wondering if you have an exit strategy or for how long do you see yourselves investing in each of these companies? And uh, talking more about the long-term partnership or what, which type of exit strategy you might have in mind. So I'll take this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we sort of try to pledge to all of our companies that we'll continue to follow on with capital in each round. Um, hopefully it gets to a point where it's actually, you know, uh, pushing the boundaries of what we can actually do. But, you know, with Comcast Ventures as a fund, you know, we've cut, you know, checks in the tens of millions. So, you know, we just actually um, uh, announced a deal yesterday out of Catalyst. Uh, for Ross Intelligence. Uh, it's an artificial intelligence company focused on the legal industry. It was our largest check to date. The main fund came in and actually uh, contributed to that as well, right? So it wasn't solely a catalyst fund deal. Um, and so there's a nice sort of alignment there from the main fund. Um, and, you know, in terms of exit strategy, you know, we typically are not acquirers of the businesses that we invest in. While we do have partnerships, uh, it's it's uh, very, very infrequent. I don't even know if we've done any acquisitions of the companies we've invested in. So we look at the traditional paths of, you know, a company pushing to go public, which is sort of the ideal, um, and then leveraging our network um, to, you know, figure out which acquisitions in the ecosystem make the most sense. Um, but we continue to follow on, um, you know, round after round, you know, all the way through usually at least to C. And we don't, we don't follow on, generally speaking. Um, uh, we try to sort of catalyze at a certain stage. We like, and I'm trying to really prove to the ventures team and frankly the industry that we don't have to take concessions on, uh, on time or return. So again, it's still pretty early for us, but we're going in with that sort of hypothesis. Twilio we invested in um, as Salesforce Ventures, right? They had a great IPO recently. So the, the 200 active companies in the portfolio uh, the, the 70 or so that are sort of no longer active have pretty much all had exits, acquisitions, or IPOs, and we're hoping for the same thing in our fund. And we've got somewhere around 50% of the portfolio companies that have taken the pledge, which is cool, because then, like Twilio, they're able, we're able to, to kind of multiply uh, that impact through grants and social giving and stuff. Yeah, I mean, similar amalgamation of answers. We do hold off dry powder to do follow-on investments, and we're looking for the traditional um, uh, ways of exit, um, not necessarily looking at an eye for us acquiring it. 
Great. But we have a question in the back. Hi there. Thank you. I'm Ella Goodwin with Vision Spring. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Salesforce. You, we, you, we have been using you guys for about 13 years now. I love Vision Spring. Um, and so, so thank you very much. And our team in Nigeria is just getting into the system. Um, my real question, though, is how has um, how has your approach to impact investing shifting or shifted or modified your approach to grant making, particularly with looking at a portfolio approach, understanding and assessing risk, and thinking about organizations that are receiving grants, particularly those of us who are in the social enterprise space who have a hybrid blended business model, right, where we've got philanthropic capital and we have earned revenue. But we have, um, some of us are in product market fit stages, some of us are in early growth, some of us are just beginning to scale, um, but we're, we're, on, we're on grant funding. Yeah. Um, and I get this like psychological dissonance where there's a lot of discipline and KPIs oriented around impact investing, but a portfolio approach to grant making and risk management in a grant portfolio may or may not be translating. And I'm wondering how it's influenced your approach to both uh, funding mechanisms. Yeah, it's a good question and we might be unique. Trillia may be a better answer to that. I mean, part of, I kind of created a little bit of a dark, not a dark wall, but a, a thick wall just on behalf of the .org team, because it's kind of a pain in the neck when you've got a new leadership team, and then you've got your founder kind of running around, sort of telling you, what, kind of giving you advice, and but you want to let them stand on their own two feet. So I kind of had to, just because of my history in the company, I had to kind of go do my own thing for a little bit while and kind of let them stand on their own. Very different than somebody who's kind of emerged together in this space. I think now, after a year, we're starting to come back together around that question. Um, but largely, it's, you know, the, the foundation used to do technology and innovation grants. Uh, they don't anymore. Uh, I, uh, you know, I kind of wish they did, but I'm not running it anymore. So where they've really focused is around education and workforce development, and that is where we're in the conversation right now about the for-profit, where does it make sense to make a grant, where does it make sense to make an investment? So we're, we're kind of backing into that partnership. But you know, these guys really started from a very different place and they didn't have the kind of baggage that I have. <laughs> <laughs> There's sort of two elements, I think, to your question. One is sort of internally, um, how has it influenced our grants process? And then also maybe um, how are we interacting with the organizations that are coming to us with that hybrid model? Um, so internally, I smile because, um, truth be told, the rigor that we were putting into the, um, the investment analysis and, and due diligence um, prompted us to be more rigorous with our grant analysis. Um, and I smile because I've been doing grant giving for 15, 20 years, so you'd think that was just like the DNA, but I think maybe I just was lulled into thinking I knew how to do that, um, but now we make sure that some of the, the rigor that we're doing with the um, investment uh, due diligence, we're doing that with our grants. Um, and then the other element of how do we interact, you know, the the organi I'll just be really candid, the organizations that come to us and talk about the hybrid model, um, I would advocate that an organization come to us and choose before they talk to us. Because otherwise there's the risk that that organization sounds less serious about being a scalable for-profit business, which is where we are directly focused in our in impact investing. Um, and so, so there are a lot of, it seems like a growing trend that there are these, these hybrid models, but when you come to me and say, I just want your money, tell me which one I should like go for, it doesn't sound you're, like you're as serious about either type of model. And so to have your answer very clear on why you have both options and which one you think is best for the type of um, approach that you're making to us. Do you, do you coordinate at all with the philanthropic side? Yeah, so you know, on our end, uh, we actually have a, a, a large grant giving organization, uh, the, the social impact team, and you know, it's funny because we see deals that come in and we're like, we're actually a better fit over here, right? And so, and they, they do the same thing and they send it back to us. And you know, they've supported organizations, Nation Swell is a big one, uh, Fast Forward, uh, Venture for America. And those are organizations that I think are phenomenal. I sit on the advisory boards, I help with, uh, but they wouldn't be a venture investment for us. And so it's, they're run completely independently, separate lines of, of management, uh, reporting structure, goals and objectives. 
And it's worked really well. We, we share, we talk, but completely separate, independent, different offices, the whole nine. Great. I saw a number of other hands. We have one right up here. Hi, uh, my name is Anita Ekinem. Um, today I'm sort of talking about uh, a bi-local initiative right here in San Francisco called One Bayview. We're trying to actually put a debt in $100 million worth of retail leakage that's left the Third Street Corridor. My issue actually is, and you touched a little bit on this as an entrepreneur, how do I get into the pipeline? Like, what does that look like? Um, who do I talk to? And what resources are available like to individuals and entrepreneurs like myself and others in the room? So that's a great question. So lots of entrepreneurs sitting in our audience today. They're excited to see new entrants to impact investing. If they want to be on your radar tactically, what should they do? So, you know, for, for <laughs> reach out, right? So LinkedIn, social media, submitting through our website. I mean, personally, I take a look at everything that comes through the door and whether it's a direct fit for our fund. You know, you go to our website, you'll see what our investment philosophy is. It's very broad. Um, so to the extent that, you know, it's, it's uh, a warm introduction is always a great way. Um, but come and find me after, stalk me online. <laughs> uh, you know, those are sort of the, the ways that I think make the most sense for us. Yeah, and we have, uh, we now have a page on the Ventures um, site, which is, you know, you can sort of put in your interest. We're always looking for great deals. You know, you have to have a Salesforce vision, right? Like, it, like a technology vision, some kind of connection to our products, our values. Um, and I sort of talked about stage. We're not angels or seed. Um, but, you know, talk to your, uh, your, if you're a little bit later on, you know, talk to your early investors. We're always getting, we're getting more deals from our, that's the first thing that we started to do actually before we funded any companies was just sort of create the, um, the landscape of great lead partners, yep. you know, like Omidyar and, and Emerson and so many others. So um, that's us. Uh, super simple um, uh, at twilio.org at the bottom of the page, it says contact. So you just can submit um, a, a, a contact, um, but I would encourage you to be very explicit about whatever uh, corporate uh, investor you're approaching, how exactly you are using the unique assets and technology that that company offers to advance your mission, because um, you will be more likely to s uh, appear uh, aligned with the strategic vision of the company and the funding um, if, you, if you can state that right up front. Yeah, and maybe just one point I'll make clear is like if you're a customer of Salesforce, like it doesn't count. We have 150,000 of them or maybe more now, um, but we get that question all the time. Um, you have to be thinking about sort of a unique way, like the distributors idea with Gaza or the communities idea with Elvis or the workforce development trailhead match with Veritas. Um, that's just a common question where they're like, well, we use Salesforce, can we apply? Um, we are thankful and grateful for everyone who uses Salesforce, but we need uh, a little bit more than that to sort of be able to sort of power companies further faster. Great, and we are um, just about at time, so I'm actually gonna give each of you a chance to just share some final thoughts uh, with the group today. And in particular, if you choose to tell us a little bit about where you hope to be five years from now. So I know both of, you know, both of you are just getting started. I know that Catalyst has been around for six years, but you just joined the fund just yeah. a year ago. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about what the future <coughs> looks like. <coughs> Pardon me. So you know, we, we hope to be at over 100 uh, companies funded. Um, you know, we would love to deploy the remainder of the capital in our first fund and raise another fund um, and continue along the path that we're on. You know, we're always looking for great founders. Uh, we're always looking to support the community. So to the extent that, um, you know, we are not a fit for the investment philosophy and where you are, please come and talk to us. We're happy to help in any way we can. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and I think for us, we want to, um, you know, <coughs> our, the, the guy who runs our uh, M&A and ventures portfolio is a guy named John Samorjai. And uh, he, when we were sort of launching the fund, he said, well, we're going to deploy the 50 million in two years, which, of which we've already, you know, deployed about a fifth of. And, you know, we just brought on a amazing executive in Claudine, and I was hoping she wasn't thinking, well, what the hell's going to happen to me in two years? <laughs> 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 um, but the truth is, what we want is, we, want, we would love to see some great exits at some level. We w really, we want to see some massive social impact. Yeah. And so we're creating our matrix right now on what is that driving. We, I would like to double the size of the fund uh, in two years. 
And actually, I really am committed to helping the portfolio increase their um, founder pool for more women and diverse CEOs. It is not a criteria in our fund. It just happens to be that more than 50% of our investments right now are women and minority founders. Um, just tend to maybe have more of an inkling in the, in the social space. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's another outcome for me is we were like, well, we increased you know, women 400% in the last 12 months. Um, we did it across the portfolio, but, it, but the impact uh, fund had a, had a big role in that. So that's another sort of place that I wanna be in, really helping the whole ventures portfolio move forward because there's gonna be deals that we find that aren't really in the impact space, but because we're now in this network, uh, that we can sort of push to our AI fund or our trailhead fund or like that. Fantastic. And what does success look like for you? Uh, plus one to what you guys <laughs> said. Um, but I, um, I'm going to do a bit of a call to action for all the investors out in this audience. If you have friends or colleagues who are at corporations that are doing grant making, go talk to them and encourage them to do investing and, more importantly, offer to be their partner. <coughs> offer to be that person that someone here said, how do I figure out how to do this? How do I get pipeline? You know, like th these, you have power to basically take this model and supercharge it and so that vision in five years is that everyone who is doing grant making is also doing impact investing because in uh, that's what we're doing and so we believe in it and we we want more of that to happen in the in the corporate world but overall also yeah we started at 15 years in these guys started at like day one which is awesome and the last thing i would say is take the pledge um really seriously it's gonna if you're an entrepreneur if you're a venture capitalist, I mean, we've got every kind of category of people. Um, it's super easy to do. You can just pledge um, time. You can pledge product. But I, I got to tell you, there is not one person I have ever met that has regretted it. Um, and just a moving a little bit. It's super easy. Tides can help you do it. Many people can help you do it. Just take your little part of your equity as a startup and just move it. And then don't think about it. And then when something happens and you get acquired or you get a public, all of a sudden you'll have this big chunk of cash to give back. And it's amazing. I love it. That's a perfect place for us to stop. A powerful vision for where we're headed, a clear call to action. So please join me in thanking our incredible panelists for a great Thanks. conversation today.